Welcome to Stelligence DevOps on AWS Radio with your hosts, Paul Duvall and Brian Jakovich. Hey, welcome to our 24th episode of DevOps on AWS Radio. I am Paul Duvall, CTO at Emphasis Stelligent. You can check out our previous episodes by searching on DevOps on AWS Radio and by going to Stelligence blog. In this episode, we're going to be discussing recent DevOps on AWS news. And I also interviewed Jeff Gallimore, who's a partner and co-founder at Accela. And we discuss all things DevOps culture, including how to measure it, psychological safety, after action reports, burnout, and a joint venture called NUMI. So this is a, a bit of a departure from some of our deep dive uh, technical uh, episodes, we talk about how organizations function, how to improve. Um, some of the highlights for me, um, in which Jeff and I have a discussion on the Amazon S3 uh, US East 1 outage from a couple of years ago in the after action report. Um, and then we talk about the Numi and Encore, and Jeff shares some super interesting anecdotes. So I think you're really going to enjoy this one. So let's get into some DevOps on AWS news. Um, just a few things I wanted to talk about. It's only been a couple weeks since the last episode, but uh, AWS uh, has a blog post on service control policies in order to set permission guardrails across accounts in your AWS organization. And so at a security administrator standpoint across multiple accounts, how do you set these policies in code and to ensure that you're following these policies across um, everything that you're doing on AWS. Over at uh, CloudAnot, there's a, a nice post on six unknown CloudFormation features that you should know about. So they talk about a number of the different policies, uh, including creation, update, deletion, and update replace policy. They also talk about the static analysis tool called CFN Lint that's been out for about a year or so and looks for best practices for CloudFormation. Uh, and then um, one that's been around for a while, but CFN and NIT. And so they talk about how to use this and how to apply some of these features um, when you're automating the provisioning uh, of your AWS resources. And then the last thing I wanted to cover was on the AWS DevOps blog, they introduced a plugin. It's an open source plugin for the Amplify CLI. It's called AWS Amplify Video. Um, and what it does is it makes it easy to incorporate video streaming into mobile and web applications that are powered by AWS Amplify. So AWS Amplify is a open source framework, makes it easy to uh, create, configure, and implement um, mobile and web apps on AWS. So basically it's an open source framework that uses a number of different AWS services. So it includes how to make development easier and also the actual actual uh, application release process so continuous delivery and things like that it really enables that and then it provides the ability to create plugins and so this is one of those plugins where you can extend the AWS Amplify capabilities so um, have a look at that if for no other reason just to understand Amplify and also it's a plugin framework Okay, so now we're gonna get into the discussion that I had with Jeff Gallimore who is a uh, founding partner at Excella so Jeff Gallimore and I have known each other for about six years. Um, we got introduced by our mutual friend and colleague, Gene Kim. Um, I think he was doing a meetup in the DC area for his book, uh, The Phoenix Project. Um, so this is back in 2013, I believe. I remember learning, uh, Jeff, that at the time that you and Gene's friendship actually goes back to your high school days. You know, since we both lived in the same area, had the same professional interests, this led to some, several coffee meetings and ultimately led to our two companies, Stelgen and Excel, are working together for about five years now. And it's been a great partnership. And so Jeff is a founding partner of the consulting firm Excella. And it, I realized when I was prepping for this show that actually I don't know all the details, or maybe I've forgotten them, uh, of how Excella got founded, when, and maybe your career up to that point. And maybe you can also share what how Excella helps its customers. So Jeff, why don't you get things started by sharing a little on your and Excella's backstory with our listeners? Sure. Thanks, Paul. So Excella uh, has been in business since 2002, uh, so a little over 17 years now. Uh, and if you if you cast your memory back to 2002, you imagine some of the things that were happening back then. It was a great time. It was a fantastic time to start an IT consulting company because the dot-com bubble had just burst. The telecom bubble had just burst. 9-11 uh, had just happened. 
uh, the economy was pretty much at its rock bottom. So it was a fantastic time to start a uh, services company. Actually, ironically, it, it was a really good time because while we were starting the company, uh, me and my, my two co-founders, uh, we were incubating and building our brand and building our relationship and starting to build relationships um, where everybody else was hunkering down and, and staying put. So when the economy did start to come back a couple of years later, um, we were very much poised to uh, to start our growth trajectory. And, and we've been growing ever since. Um, so every year we've grown in both revenue and headcount uh, for 17 straight years. So it's a pretty great track record and it's a credit to a lot of great people who are here and have been here and have done some really great work for our clients. Um, in terms of what led to starting Excel in the first place, at least for my story, uh, I, I, I came out of UVA Wahoo Wah, national champs in basketball, which was fantastic. Um, my first job was with um, a company called AMS, and I and I started out as a developer and a DBA, uh, slinging code with Oracle. Uh, and then I left that company to go work for a company that was much much smaller. Uh, I was employee number sixty, and I saw what a small privately held group of professionals uh, looked like. They were highly collaborative, highly talented. It was a great family feel. Um, and I really, really enjoyed that. And they, they operated on this premise um, that I still carry with me today. Take care of your people, take care of your clients, and the rest takes care of itself. It was a very simple, very powerful philosophy. To fast forward a little bit, that company got bought um, by a much, much larger publicly traded company as part of an acquisition strategy and through various integrations and rebranding um, became an office of a mid-sized system integrator. And everything was great while things were great. Um, but then, like I said, that dot-com bust happened, the telecom bust happened. And we saw what a publicly traded company who has investors and cares about what the street thinks, uh, how they make decisions. And it didn't, it just didn't align with that philosophy that that I had come to value, which was take care of your people, take care of your clients, letting the rest take care of itself. It had wandered into the bottom line and quarterly earnings reports and the decisions that were just being handed down were didn't feel very good. Um, and so the choice was either to uh, tow the corporate line because that was my job um, or or not choose something different. And um, and I chose to go back to back to what I really enjoyed and loved and valued. Uh, and we, Bert and Steve and I, those are my two other co-founders, um, really wanted to do that together again. And so that's what Excel became. That was the genesis story. Very interesting. And so Burton and Steve, um, you had worked with them at uh, AMS or that other company that you joined? Right. So that, that small company um, was, was called Perspective Technology Corporation. Uh, Steve Cooper was one of the founders of that company. Burton was already there when I joined. Steve um, eventually uh, left a couple of years later. Burton and I stayed peers for about six years at that company. Uh, and then through that downturn, you know, there was a group of us that, that started having discussions about getting back to what we were familiar with and what we had loved. And, and Burton and Steve were, were part of those conversations. And ultimately, the three of us decided to, to go do it again. So how does Excel help customers? So we're a um, we're a consulting company. And in terms of how we're we're helping our clients and how we're going to market is really based on four primary offerings, places that we've built uh, a really great track record and with some really strong capabilities. So one is helping organizations engage with their customers or stakeholders digitally and creating experiences that they love. Um, another one is uh, a big one that's in the federal government and frankly, in any large enterprise, and that's uh, the issue of legacy modernization. So there's a lot of old systems that, that tend to drag organizations down. So we've, we've built some particular expertise and capabilities and successes around modernizing uh, legacy technologies and systems. And then another one is uh, around helping organizations unlock the power of their data to make better decision making. So there we're talking about advanced analytics and AI. Uh, and then the last one, which is is really a thread through all of the other things that we do. Uh, and that's about agile transformation. And when we're talking about agile transformation, we're not talking about just agile, the capital A. Um, we're talking really about agility and the principles and the mindsets. And this is about helping organizations and teams and individuals work better, work more efficiently, collaborate more, 
uh, figure out the right things to be working on, get more done with less waste uh, for better results. So that's really a, a transformational offering, whereas the other three are really about building stuff. And so in that building stuff, where does um, the cloud and AWS and, and DevOps fit into that? Cloud, DevOps, AWS, um, anytime that we're building something, our preference is to A, build it in the cloud, um, and our preference there is with AWS. And anytime we're building something in the cloud, we want to really deliver it quickly and with stability and resiliency. So that's where the, the DevOps and, and the engineering that, that comes along with or that is enabled with by the cloud uh, really comes in. So um, without putting too fine a point on it, the cloud, AWS, and DevOps is really baked into everything that we're doing when it comes to building stuff. So I know you've been studying culture and safety over the past few years now, like how to measure it, how to change it, burnout, things like that. I'd watch one of your meetup talks that you'd given locally in the DC area. And, and, you know, sometimes you hear people say that, you know, DevOps is all about culture. And I would say that a lot of people are probably confounded by this. Um, so why don't you talk about your interest in culture and how you find that that relates to DevOps? Yeah, it's, this culture is one of these one of these confounding terms. Um, we, we've all been conditioned that culture is this really important thing. It, it's uh, if you know John Willis and Damon Edwards and Jess Humble, they they coined this term "calms" culture, automation, lean measurement, and sharing. So it's the, the kind of the key aspects of what DevOps is all about. So culture is that first letter, and then sharing, which is the the bookend, the other bookend. Um, is also related to culture. Peter Drucker, who's the management guru, s says uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So he's talking about the importance of culture over other important things for an organization like strategy. Uh, Gartner says 46% of CIOs reported that culture is their biggest barrier to change and achieving their objectives. So all of these things are telling us that culture is this, this really important thing to organizations. We hear it anecdotally, and yet we don't as, a, as an industry, really understand what culture is all about and why it's important or how to measure it or what its effect is on the performance of the organization. So that's, that was some of, the, some of the aha moments that I had uh, a few years ago when the 2015 State of DevOps report came out. Uh, and it talked about some research and some science behind certain cultural aspects being predictive of IT performance and organizational performance. It was the first time that I had ever seen real scientific, rigorous, definitive language being given to this thing called culture. And so what, what were those constructs that uh, allowed you to look at culture in that way? Yeah, the framework of the construct that was presented in that report was the Westrom culture topology. Uh, so Westrom, Dr. Ron Westrom was a sociologist several decades ago and did a lot of did a lot of work in hospitals, um, interestingly enough. And he observed that some hospitals were getting vastly different outcomes than other hospitals in terms of the health outcomes of the of the patients. And so he wanted to understand why. And what he discovered was that certain certain dynamics in those organizations around uh, particularly information sharing and collaboration and failure and how failure was treated were indicative of of these these health outcomes so he created this typology with three culture types uh, the first one is pathological the second one is bureaucratic and then the third one is generative so pathological is really about power orientation uh, failure is punished, uh, messengers are shot. Uh, the bureaucratic tends to be rule-oriented cultures. Um, and then the generative culture was the one, the one that is, is uh, most predictive of, of these uh, higher performing organizations. That's one where uh, failure leads to inquiry. There's high collaboration and information sharing, particularly across organizational boundaries. Uh, messengers are trained to deliver quote unquote bad news just a very different feel. And based on my experience and the people that I've talked to, when you start seeing what those those attributes are, and you think back to your own experience in various organizations and even in specific teams, you can start to get the feel for which of these cultural topologies you've experienced along your career trajectory. Yeah, for sure. Um, so how have you seen organizations, you know, from this 2015 State of DevOps report, 
how are people able to take that information and then use it on their own teams in terms of figuring out if they're generative or power oriented or, you know, somewhere in between? Right. So the way that we've used it both internally and with with some of our uh, clients, it varies. We, we've used some diagnostics. Uh, so in the state of DevOps report and also in some research papers that came out of that from Dr. Nicole Forsgren and Jez Humble, um, who should be familiar names to, to this community, there are some questions, some diagnostic questions about culture. And we've used those questions to help uh, surface where there are uh, where there are issues and and start having conversations about that. So one technique that we use again is to assess assess culture. And because now we have this framework where we can describe it, we can start to measure it. And because we can measure it, now we can actually start to to do things that will hopefully change culture uh, for the better, more towards that generative uh, culture. Because now we can actually detect whether the actions that we're taking are having any effect. So one is assessing. Another one is um, is education. And so we can talk to people about what culture is, why it's important, what it means, uh, how you can change it. So I do classes internally at Excella to, to help teach all of these things. And I also take this show out on the road, so to speak, and take it to our project teams uh, out on client sites. And I also do these, these talks at meetups and conferences, again, to get the the education out there that culture is really a thing. Um, some other tactics is is modeling the behavior, and and this is something that I try to do, and I I, I struggle with probably more times than I would like to admit of, of making sure that I am showing up as a leader the the right way because people are looking at me for better or for worse as an example of what the culture quote unquote is and what's being valued. So if I'm not promoting a generative culture culture by my words and my actions. Why would I expect the rest of our organization to to be doing that? Now, can you also affect culture by incorporating certain capabilities, like continuous delivery? Can that then affect culture as well? So, yes, actually, some of the, ironically, some of the technical practices can can impact uh, the culture. I've seen, I saw a great talk uh, from Mike McGar, who um, used to be on my team uh, before he before he landed at Netflix and now at Slack. But he, he delivered a talk out here uh, last year uh, at a meetup that was talking about how to change culture through the introduction of tooling and technologies. It was a fascinating talk about where you start and what the context is and how you start to, to move the needle with the introduction of certain technologies that actually promotes some of the cultural attributes and the values that you, that you want. So in continuous delivery, for example, if I want to be able to go from code commit to running in production in, say, 20 minutes, or I want to be able to do 10 deploys a day or 100 deploys a day or whatever it happens to be, well, that's going to take a certain uh, mindset shift around experimentation and failure and collaboration because none of that stuff happens if you don't have those things. Right. So I see. So some of the technical practices can help culture and, you know, incorporating some of those behaviors. Um, and maybe it's little by little uh, that that happens on a, on a typical team. So this also relates to the idea of psychological safety. And, and in, in the talk that I saw that you gave, we'll put that in the show notes, you talked about the, the Google rework study, uh, Amy Edmondson. Maybe if you can talk about maybe a little bit of that research that you've seen and, and also examples of, of psychological safety that you've seen out in the wild. Yeah, so it was a very interesting path for me. Once I discovered that that Westrom culture topology framework, it was like the world opened up to me uh, around this whole cultural thing. And studying of Westrom led to studying of blameless postmortems and just culture and uh, Sidney Decker's work, um, which also then led to uh, discovering this this Google rework study that Google did, uh, I think probably two or three years ago at this point. So the basic gist of this is that the Google rework team uh, looked at hundreds of teams at Google trying to determine what, uh, what made some teams better performing than others. And what they found was that psychological safety uh, was, quote, far and away the most important dynamic that set successful teams apart from other teams, even above things like the structure and the clarity of the team or the impact or the meaning 
uh, of the work that the team was doing. Psychological safety was far and away the most important dynamic. And what that really meant, just to put some handles on what, what psychological safety is really all about, it, it's how you would answer this question or, or, or respond to this statement. If I make a mistake on our team, it is not held against me. So you can see the connection back to that Westrom framework uh, related to failure. If I make a mistake on our team, it is not held against me. Would you strongly disagree with that statement? Would you strongly agree with that statement or are you somewhere in the middle? And to the degree that you strongly agree with that statement, it indicates how much psychological safety you have within the context of your team or your organization. And so again, that Google Rework study to connect it back to that determined that the team members agreement with that statement, making a mistake on our team, not held against me, was the primary predictor and far and away the biggest predictor of the performance of the team. And so the conclusion was the safer you feel, the more you engage in these learning behaviors. That was the conclusion that they had made. Uh, the safer you feel, the more you engage in learning behaviors. And the more you engage in learning behaviors, the better you're going to perform. And so, you know, I think a lot of people, I mean, you just touched on it right there, but, you know, a lot of people hear blameless postmortems. They hear, you know, it's not held against me. And they, they're thinking, well, where's the accountability in that? Right. Yeah. Th I've experienced this this perspective before too. When, when people hear blamelessness, uh, they, they think that that's code for lack of accountability. And what I have experienced is it's actually quite the opposite, that creating a safe environment for people to be vulnerable um, and share mistakes and talk about failure actually promotes accountability. And I'll give you this, I'll give you this example. In the, in the book, Just Culture, it was written by Sidney Decker. So he was an airline safety investigator. So this guy goes in after bad things happen with airplanes and tries to figure out what, what happened and what can we learn from that. And he, he talked about an incident that happened. Um, it's called a runway incursion incident. So there was basically a plane on the, on the runway where it shouldn't have been. And following that runway incursion incident, the air traffic controllers that were involved in that incident actually got brought up on criminal charges. And what they discovered was that in the year following those criminal charges being brought against the air traffic controllers, that there were 50% fewer reported incidents uh, than, there were, than there were in the year prior. Now, I'll leave it as an exercise for the listener. Was it really that the incidents went down or was it that they just weren't being reported? And okay, I said it was rhetorical. I don't think it's rhetorical. I, I think the incidents were still happening and they just weren't being reported. And the, the cruel irony of that is that uh, airline safety was now impacted negatively because the airlines lost the opportunity to learn for 50% of those incidents because there was no place for them to, to talk about it and learn from it. And those, that same dynamic happens in our, in our teams that if, if people don't have a way to talk about failure and to talk about mistakes in a safe way, then they're, they're not going to. They're, they're going to uh, censor themselves. And not only is the organization going to uh, lose the opportunity to learn from that, uh, it's not, it certainly doesn't promote accountability uh, because then it becomes some manager or quote unquote leader starting to punch a hole in, in the veil of mystery about what went down and why. And, and then you start playing the blame game. And that definitely does not promote accountability. Right, and they're spending all their time on maybe trying to hide what had happened uh, instead of actually having an open discussion about it. And moreover, focusing on fixing the system. Because in Sidney Decker's work, it's, it, he really talks about, you know, I think in one of the books, it's, he puts human error in quotes. It's not, it's not that human error doesn't exist, but the, the idea that you're focusing on improving the system. I would imagine most listeners are familiar uh, with the S3 outage from um, a couple years ago. But they had an incident report, and you, you talked about that a little bit. Maybe you can share that in more detail. Right. Yeah. So this is so what you and I were talking about was going back to, I believe, it was uh, February 28th, 2017. Uh, AWS had a had a massive uh, S3 failure or outage on the East Coast. Um, and I think the, the, the service was down for, I want to say, six hours. Um, they published, AWS published the after action review or the, the postmortem report explaining what happened based on their investigation. 
uh, and all the analysis that they had done. And what they pointed out as the trigger, I'm not going to say the root cause. Root cause isn't a thing for those of you who know who you are out there listening. Um, root cause isn't a thing. But one of the triggers was uh, was an engineer who had typed a command intending to bring down a small number of servers in, uh, I think, the billing subsystem for S3, but had instead had a typo, and it brought down a large number of servers in two of the critical S3 subsystems. And then that caused a cascading failure, and then the whole, the whole service goes down. So AWS, with a lot of transparency, which I will give them a lot of credit for, uh, publishes their after-action report. And when you're reading that report, it's, it's talking about the, the system effects and the system causes, not the humans that, quote unquote, cause the outage. So they were making statements like, we have not completely restarted the index subsystem or the placement subsystem in our larger regions for many years. The process of restarting these services and running the necessary safety checks to validate the integrity of the metadata took longer than expected. This was great. I love this one. The tool used allowed too much capacity to be removed too quickly. The tool allowed, not the human caused, but the tool allowed. And then they also said that we will also make changes to improve the recovery time of key S S3 subsystems. So if you read this report, it's all about the system and the controls that are in place in the system. It doesn't read like human error. A human didn't cause that error. There were a lot of contributing factors uh, that led to that outage. And AWS, again, to their credit, um, was transparent about what a lot of those were. And they did not zero in on a single root cause because there isn't one uh, in complex systems. And it certainly wasn't human error. And they're focusing on fixing the systems. Uh, essentially, the system didn't have the guardrails in place that would prevent something like that from happening. So they're focusing on proving it going forward. So, for example, if they were focusing on, quote, human error, uh, they could easily just blame it on the human, sweep it under the rug, and then move on without actually fixing the problems. Right. Well, in, in most organizations, um, the response to that type of event, that outage or that incident, would actually lead to some sort of punishment and maybe even the engineer getting fired because of this, what's, what's called a bad apple uh, theory, is that the person was the, a person was the cause of, of an outage or an incident or a problem or a failure. And if we just didn't have that person in our environment anymore, we wouldn't have those kinds of problems. And that's just, it's such bad thinking and it's, and it's not true and it's not the case. Oftentimes it's, the, it's a, a lot of contributing factors and it's the system, which includes the people, acting within the system or the construct that, that management has set up that ends up leading to whatever problem or incident or outage that you end up having. So Jeff, in the 2015 State of DevOps report, um, it talked about how culture can uh, affect performance, but it also talked about how culture can uh, predict burnout as well. Right. So in the construct that's in the 2015 State of DevOps report, going back to that, the Western culture topology and so, some of those cultural attributes, it, yes, it was predictive of IT and organizational performance. And yes, it also predicted uh, lower levels of burnout. And so why is that important? Well, well, let's talk about what burnout actually is. It's A, it's pervasive in our industry. We, we deal with high stress uh, high workload uh, environments. It creates physical and emotional exhaustion. There's sometimes problems with efficacy that we have. Cynicism starts to creep in. I mean, if, I, I have certainly identified with those with those things um, at certain points in my career. And the fact is, or at least the science says, that certain cultural aspects, like having a generative culture will predict lower levels of burnout. And so when, when I'm talking to organizations um, and leaders in particular about culture and why they should care about this, yeah, I'm, I'm talking about cultural effects uh, on IT performance and organizational performance. You want better results. You want to achieve your goals as an organization. Absolutely. But do you care about your people too? Because your people experience burnout or might be experiencing burnout. You might be experiencing burnout. And a better culture, if you care about your people, can have a positive effect on that. Um, and there's some pa pretty powerful stories that 
um, I have heard about and I, I've, uh, I've talked to people about who have experienced burnout and why they experienced burnout. And I personally, every time I hear about that now, um, it is a, uh, it's a conversation that I need to have um, if, if there's some role that I can play in helping with that situation because the toll that burnout can take is really, really heavy. Um, and that as a leader in particular, if I, have a, if I have a chance to move the needle in the right direction on that, I really wanna do that. So speaking of culture, um, you know, the new me story is really interesting. Some may or may not have heard of it. And you MMI, you can actually find there's a whole episode on this American life. Um, Jeff, why don't you describe that story a bit? Yeah, this is a, a fascinating story about uh, the effects of culture and in particular leadership uh, in that culture and the difference that those things can make in the performance of an organization. Uh, so the, the story about Numi is that it was a joint venture between Toyota and General Motors uh, back, in the, back in the early 80s. The reason that Toyota wanted to engage in this joint venture is because the United States was starting to levy a lot of tariffs on the cars that they were importing into the United States. Toyota was importing into the United States. And GM wanted to enter into this joint venture because they wanted to figure out why Toyota was eating their lunch uh, when it came to the market share in the auto industry. You know, how exactly was Toyota creating high quality vehicles at a low cost um, and bringing them to market a lot faster than GM could? And so they formed this joint venture around uh, a plant in Fremont, California, that ironically was a GM plant that had closed two years prior. So GM and Toyota entered into this venture in 1984. The GM Fremont plant closed in 1982 because, and I will quote various reports, they had the worst workforce in the auto industry. It was in 1978, they had, you can look at the, the number of hours that was uh, necessary to produce a car, and it was roughly double what uh, Toyota was, was spending. The quality reports were, I think, three times as high as, as what Toyotas were in terms of the defects per uh, car. So it certainly was not a uh, high-performing plant. And so GM closed it in 1982. So again, two years later, uh, GM and, and Toyota entered into this joint venture around the same plant uh, in Fremont, California. And they hired 85% of the same workforce which is another fascinating, fascinating fact. So they ended up getting, though, wildly different results. And so here's kind of the setup for this. It was the same physical plant, 85% of the same workforce. Uh, it took GM 43.1 labor hours to produce a car in 1978. And then in 1986, so two years after the joint venture started, it was down to 20.8 labor hours per car. So they had more than doubled the productivity of, of the workforce of that factory. And the quality that they were producing was roughly on par with the factories in Japan. So what changed? What changed between 1982 and when GM closed the plant in 1986 when they were getting these great results? And the two answers that, uh, that I came up with that all the reports say, two things changed. Number one is the culture changed. So Toyota basically imported their culture. They imported the Toyota production system to the newbie plant, which is really all about learning and improvement and the principles and the values and the mindsets that come along with that. And then the other thing that changed was leadership. How leaders showed up with their workforce and with their teams also changed. And those two things actually go together. And so you get wildly different results. And in this case, I have a lot better. Every time I hear that story, I'm just so amazed by it. So 85% of the same workforce and, you know, just drastically different results. You know, one of the parts of that story they talk about, I think, is emblematic. And you think about the, the whole idea of in continuous delivery of stopping the line, you know, when something goes wrong. And they had a culture that, you know, the culture that allowed them to do that. Whereas prior to Numi, when they were at the jam factory, if, if they stopped the line, that, that was frowned upon, to say the least. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah. And then they incorporated the and-on cord. So when something went wrong, they pulled the cord, and people weren't used to that. And I remember them t you know, feeling like, oh, you know, it's a failure. We're going to be looked down upon. And the uh, Toyota, the people from Toyota talking about how, no, that's what we should be doing. They ended up doing 
I forget what the number was, but it was so much more. But that clearly it leads to higher quality uh, by finding the problem when the point that it actually is occurring still much, until much later and, and worse, you know, when the actual uh, customers are actually <laughs> driving it, right? Right. Two quick stories around that. One related to uh, Numi and the one from our own project teams. Uh, at, at Numi, there was a report that was being presented to um, to leadership, and it was it measured the number of Andon cord pulls per day. And uh, just to give you the numbers, uh, it was on a trend of about a thousand Andon cord pulls per day. So people were stopping the line or calling for help about a thousand times a day. So just to have a rough order of magnitude there on times of number number of things that that were out of the ordinary that required help. And then the number started to trend down and it got down to about 800. Uh, And the response from leadership was, this is a problem. Why is it going down from 1,000 to 800? We're losing opportunities to learn to learn. And so they they viewed the the drop in and on cord pulls as a problem, not as a that is a good thing. And it's just very antithetical to how a lot of organizations think. Because uh, prior to, to Numi, it was, you know, don't stop the line ever for anything. You got to keep it running and we'll fix the problems later. And that was not the culture that, that Toyota imported into that plant about, around the Angle and Court. Uh, so the other anecdote I wanted to share that was exactly related to that. Um, one of our project teams I discovered just recently was a revelation um, what had actually been implementing a virtual and on cord um, on the team so they had written a, a, a slash command in slack for an and on cord pull and it did some really cool things like uh, you, you set off some lights in the team room and there was this wavy airman that would that would inflate and start doing its thing and the response of the team was okay drop what you're doing and uh, swarm to the person who just pulled the and on cord uh, to figure out whatever the whatever the problem was and how to resolve it and what we could learn from that. Well, they had been tracking statistics for six months um, around the the Andon cord pulls and then marrying that up with the flow metrics that we we had in terms of the amount of work getting done and cycle times. And what they discovered was that there was an inverse correlation between lead time for changes and Andon cord pulls. So as Andon cord pulls went up, lead time for changes went down, particularly in uh, development. That was the highest correlation. So if you looked at a a story moving its way through JIRA and then work being done and code being pushed to production, uh, cycle time and the lead time actually went down as the number of and on cord pulls went up. It was just, it was a fascinating, it was a fascinating uh, experiment for them to to run that. I was so glad that they did that. That's a great story. I have to imagine the change failure rates went down as well. Indeed. So you know, kind of related to the last topic I, I wanted to mention to you um, was I was in California. I was at the airport. I was waiting for an Uber. This was November last year. And uh, Mr. Gene Kim walks by. <laughs> and uh, and actually, I ended up staying at a hotel that was right across um, from the NUMI plant. I, I believe it's the NUMI plant. It's in Fremont, California. That's where the Tesla plant is now. And so... Anyway, we got talking a bit, and I think I had seen you a few weeks prior to that. And he had mentioned that the two of you were working on uh, closure, right? That's a, a new language that you wanted to to learn. Or you, I, I think on Twitter you were seeking, you know, ideas, and, and Gene must have gotten back to you. Right. So, you know, I do my best to learn like a new programming language, maybe once a year, maybe once every other year. So Python was my language last year. So yeah, I want to maybe if you can uh, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, yeah, this was uh, this was kind of fun. Um, so this was maybe six or seven months ago. So last fall, um, I really wanted to get back into programming. I just I had an itch that hadn't been scratched in a long, long time. Um, I, I started my career as a developer. Um, probably the first eight, eight or ten years, I was really hands-on keyboard, slinging code. Um, and now, really, I just live vicariously through a lot of our engineers and developers, and it's. It's great that I, I can still maintain that connection, but boy, I really love creating stuff. And it's been a long time since I've, I've created anything. Um, so it got to the point where I wanted, to, I wanted to pick a language. I wanted to learn something new and different and, and get productive uh, in an IDE and a command line again. 
And so I threw it out on Twitter. Um, what language sh should I start with? If I, I, have, I have choice of any language, I am so distanced from, from the Java that I used to know and, and love, um, I could basically pick up anything at this point. Um, and so I got, a, I got a lot of answers. Uh, I got JavaScript, I got uh, C Sharp, I got Ruby, and then Gene weighs in. And Gene and I had been talking about stuff and I, I understood that he had been working with Clojure. And he, he said, here was his response to this, Jeff, you should learn a functional programming language, not declarative, functional programming language, and you should use Clojure because I've been programming in Clojure. It helped me rediscover the joy of programming and it changed my life. And I said, okay, well, that's hard to pass up. Well, what cinched the deal was that he was also willing to, to pair with me and teach me closure. So here I have Gene willing to pair with me, teach me closure. It changed his life, joy of programming, like, okay, I'm in. When do we start? And so we've been we've been hacking on closure stuff for about six or seven months now. That's really cool. Yeah, thanks for sharing that story. So um, how can people get in touch with you, Jeff? Yeah, the best way to get in touch with me, I'm on Twitter uh, at Jay Gallimore. Uh, you can email me at jeff.gallimore at excella.com. You can go to my blog, itsanicelife.com, uh, and reach out to me that way. LinkedIn, uh, I'm, I'm findable. I'm definitely findable. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Jeff. We've been speaking with Jeff Gallimore, who is a founding partner at Excella. Thanks a lot, Jeff. My pleasure. Thanks, Paul. For the latest DevOps best practices on AWS, follow our blog at www.stelligent.com blog.